first exposed to uh, his material, uh, back in the early days when I was starting to do, as you know, I do a lot of this improv stuff with work stuff, um, but I was looking at well, how do we make connections uh, between that. And I started to say, well, you know, is there a way to connect some of this stuff to the work environment? And that's when I discovered a book called Game Storming, written by this man right here I'm about to introduce. Uh, he's also the author of a book called Liminal Thinking, and uh, he is the part of the School of the Possible. Uh, and he's going to be talking about shifting your culture into innovation mode with visual thinking, which I assume means uh, he's going to be connecting some stuff up here, because I assume he's going to be doing some visual thinking along with us. So I'll give him a second. Uh, but then without further ado, Please welcome uh, Dave Gray. We can do this. All right. So, so I'm going to introduce you to, to one of the, the core improv things. And this is the notion, and you may have heard it all before. Most people have heard of it. It is the one called Yes And. So yes and is a very simple idea. That is, if I'm in a scene, or maybe I'm in an office in a meeting, and my partner gives and provides something to me, I accept that offer as true, and I say yes. And I don't just say yes to it, I also add something to it with yes and. So uh, for example, I, I might say, hey. But. Yes, but. <laughs> that's how we know we're in Canada, because that's what we do in Canada, because we're very polite. So we don't want to say no, so we say yes, but, which is really just no, right? What would happen to your stories if you had said no? They'd, they'd stop, right? It's the end of your story. So think about that. Again, one of the things to tie back to is, again, think about the effect that sort of mindset has on your office environment if you're saying no to everything, as opposed to if you start playing around with yes and. All right, uh, yes? That's true, yeah, you have to really listen, right? Yeah, I'd rather talk about this than what you just said, so yes, but that. Cool. Excellent. So let's once again welcome Dave Grant. Hey. Uh, like Tabs here, I feel very welcome, and I feel like this place is very connected, and I'm uh, super impressed by all the talks so far. I think they're fantastic. Um, I also had a chip on my shoulder, which I want to share with everyone, because I think uh, the, the story of getting angry to get over your fear is one good approach. And for me, it was being an artist. I was always an artist, and I got really tired of... Artists have a similar path to women, I think, in some ways, because everyone thinks you're a loser, your dad thinks you're going to starve, your mom worries about you, your, um, your whole family thinks you're a basket case loser. They associate creativity with uh, diddling around and doing nothing. And so I was always pissed off, because if I said I was an artist, I would hear, oh, so's my grandmother. She makes really pretty uh, paintings of flowers, and you should look at them. And it's like, well, OK, but all right. But that's not the category I want you to put me in when I say I'm an artist. So I, I identify with that feeling of having that chip on your shoulder and just needing to prove something to the world, like, hey, you know what? I'm an artist, but I can be a fucking millionaire. I fuck you all. You know? <laughs> anyway, and my dad is actually now, I don't know what he did. Like, they all think I'm lucky, just the lucky idiot. My brother calls me the lucky idiot. <laughs> okay, so that's one. There are other ways of getting over your fear that um, I think have come up, but one of the biggest ones for me is just taking small steps. You don't have to quit your day job to start your dream job. Uh, you just have to get started thinking about how you're going to make your dream job your day job. Just think about it. And so you don't have to do it all at once. And For example, I started my company very gradually. I actually hired my first employee before I quit my day job. Hello. You can do it. It can be done. And then I went to my boss and I said, you know what, i got to quit because i got a company. <laughs> And I don't, really don't want to be taking all my customer calls while I'm sitting at my desk. I was working in a newspaper at the time. And, uh, but hey, how about this? Would you consider turning my salary into a retainer so I could keep working with you? And he's like, well, let me check. And he checked and he's like, we'll just turn your salary into a retainer. You keep your salary. <laughs> and then eventually I had to fire even my company because it's like they, didn't, they were too cheap. <laughs> 
I was like, oh, sorry, uh, but we can't work together anymore. Anyway, it was really interesting, but you can do that. You can ramp one down while you ramp the other one up. Okay, next thing. Peter has offered to be my, he's my, what would you call yourself? Sherpa. <laughs> anyway, he's helping me today. Um, so one thing is, uh, I asked Vickis for his yarn because I thought that was so fucking awesome. Excuse my language. I'm going to use a little bit of language. Trigger warning. Okay. All right. So I'm going to throw this to you. But I'm going to keep a whole little part of it. Okay. And we're going to try and tie up the whole room with this ball of yarn. We're going to go as far as the yarn will go. And I need your help with this because I need you to ask questions, and that's how we know that we're doing all right. The more tangled up we are, the better we're doing. So every time someone asks a question, Peter is gonna throw you the yarn. He's gonna hand you the mic. By the way, I want you to start asking questions now. Okay, and I'll draw and I'll, I'm gonna, if you have paper. Uh, actually, what's your name? Jeff. Jeff, I actually already have your question here. Because I wrote it down. Can I throw the yarn out? How to scale what's in your heart? And I want to answer yours, so let's throw it to him first. Okay, you ready? Do it. <laughs> All right. Because I like that question. I think it's a great question. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, this is why it's a team, right? Yeah. Hold on. Oh, here, on. <laughs> I need a little more slack here. This is also, this is also, but you could just hold it up. If it tickles, that's part of the fun. Okay? All right. Now I have a microphone. So let me also say, before Jeff uh, launches into his five minute question, um, grab some paper, because I'll be doing some drawing and I want to invite you all to draw along with me. So if you don't have paper, get, some piece, get a piece of paper from someone at your table. I'm going to be drawing a bunch of stuff as we talk. Check I'll one, stand two. up to talk, I'll sit down to draw, okay? Go ahead, Jeff. You, you wanted, you, I had a question from you, which is how to scale what's in your heart. Did you have a new question? Well, yeah, yeah my, my, my question was, what sort of questions did you want us to ask? Oh, whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> ask well, me anything, AMA. Uh, then I guess my question is, how do I scale what's in my heart? <laughs> That's a great question. Is that a good question? Actually, I think this whole talk is going to get to that one piece at a time. But I'm going to start by actually, oh, and I want to also say, did you say Yoda or yoga before? Yoga. See, this is one of my secrets. Bad hearing comes up with all kinds of ideas. Because when she said, if you could substitute yoga, Yoda for yoga, and everything she said is still true. If you, he's <laughs> <laughs> and it makes perfect sense within a Star Wars universe. Uh, so let me say this to you. Jeff, this is for you. Trust the force. Trust your feelings. <laughs> The force will be with you always. And you can, you can scale it, but we'll get there. It's going to be a little... I've traveled from one end of this country to another, and you can't tell me that there's some magical force that binds us all together. There is. Han Solo episode four. And I Tim think, Hortons. I do not think the force is imaginary. I think it is real. And I think that Tabitha touched on it when she talked about the energy of connectedness. What is the force? It's an energy field that surrounds all living things. It connects us with something else, and then it binds the galaxy together. <laughs> something in between there, I can't remember. Help me, someone, come on, Star Wars, help me. It connects us, it binds the galaxy, it does something else, but it's just, it's real. Okay, and I believe there's a dark side and a light side too. I believe that's also real. And so this is the question we all have to ask. Um, Jedi, Sith, or citizen? Ordinary creature of the galaxy. Which are we going to be? You know? Because if you're not a Jedi or the Sith, you're probably going to uh, live in a world that's dominated by one or the other. Or both. Or be in the middle of a battle zone. Okay? All right. Positive thinking. That was another one I wanted to hit on. I could not totally hear the question. I'm not sure where it came from, but... Was it critical of positive thinking or supportive of positive thinking? Because I've heard both. Uh, the question about positive thinking or the comment. If someone was asking you, Lauren? 
Someone said something about positive thinking, the power. Yeah, what, what was the comment? Was it, was it, because I've heard people say, well, that's bullshit. I've heard people say it's everything. So I'm curious what your opinion is. So raise your hand if you believe in the power of positive thinking. Wow, okay. Anyone at all think it's bullshit? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I, so that's a good point. I think that you, whether you believe in it or not, here's the thing. Um, science is a good example of, oh, we had a question. Can I give a qualified answer? Sure. We need you to give them the microphone. Okay. Can I throw the yarn at him? <laughs> yeah, you have to throw the yarn at him. That's the rule. <laughs> and if you get touched or rubbed by the yarn, just lean into it. It's part of the flow. Be like water. Be like water. We can we can always come up with scissors later and cut you out, cut you loose. So, so the, what I found is that people tend to not think highly of positive thinking because they think it's saying that you know that a piece of shit isn't a piece of shit, right? Right. That they're gone. You're just pretending everything's good, right? But I tend to believe in resilience thinking, which is how to turn that situation into something that's positive, or how to keep keep yourself in a mental space you're able to deal with whatever comes at you. That's what I prefer to look at instead of positive thinking. Ah, uh, right. So here's a, this is a good way of thinking about it, and I agree. If your positive thinking is based in an unrealistic assessment of the context and the situation, if you're living in a dream world, it's not going to work. You have to be grounded in reality. But the fact is that whenever you're presented with a binary pro yes, no proposition, there's always about 10, at least 10 or 20 choices that you can make. You can step away from the situation. You can ignore it completely. Um, I mean, if you're in a large organization, you can probably get away with not doing any work at all, uh, right? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, we all know people who are doing that, right? Just hiding. They found their niche, right? And anything that threatens the organization is threatening their niche, right? Anything that threatens job security is threatening their niche. So it's all about making the higher-ups happy, right? Just or hiding from them. All right, we had, I, I want to start, I want to actually talk about a couple of things, and then we can do some questions. Um, I wanted to start with this. This is my notes from what everybody said today, so I don't have to say it, because I would have said all these things, or I, would, I certainly agree with all of them. They're prerequisites for some of the stuff that I want to talk to you about. So, Vikas. Vikas? Vika. Vikas? All right. He left it too, so I'm okay. Um, talked about listening to the whispers of your heart, right? Follow your purpose. Um, anyone have any skepticism or doubt that that is what, that's why we're here? Because I think that's the answer to tab with this question, why are we here? The answer is inside every one of us, you just have to figure it out. Anyone have a debate on that or question before I go on? Because I think that's a really critical prerequisite. Nobody. 100% alignment on purpose, excellent. Uh, finding and engage the kingpins. This came from Sandeep. Anyone have any like skepticism or quibbles around finding the kingpins? Okay, I wanted to I want to give you a little bit of uh, something from social network analysis here. This comes from one of my books. Uh, it's somewhere here it is. So this is the stuff that she was talking about, but this is how it ends up coming out in uh, social networking uh, language, the language of social network analysis. And uh, Vikas is not here to correct me, unfortunately, but uh, I would want to validate this with him. But basically it comes from a guy named Ron Burt, Ronald Burt, who's been a, done, like a, a luminary in social networks. You don't have to take a picture. You can just search for Dave Gray, Anatomy of a Social Network, if you want. You'll find it on the internet. Uh, but brokerage is about connecting between the silos or the clusters of the network. Um, closure is about building trust within a cluster. So usually people do one or the other because you can't build deep, intimate relationships with your team and also be jumping around between boundaries. So usually people are either going to be a broker for you, like connecting you, or they're going to be a trust builder. Some, I mean, brokers can be trusted too, but they're always a little bit of an outsider, right? Okay. Um, then there's this thing called betweenness. This is a thing in, in the hierarchical, old-style industrial organization that is exploited. You can't, this is why people get pissed off if you, if you talk to your boss's boss, or you talk to your boss's colleague. They get pissed off, right? Because you're fucking with their betweenness. They want to be in between. 
right? So this is what we have to kill. We have to break this. This whole thing about betweenness, in any kind of organization, we have to, we have to be the enemy of people hogging. These are like the bridge, the, the troll under the bridge, or the, 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 uh, the knight who says, okay, this is my bridge, pay the toll or I kill you before you cross the bridge. That's, that's between us, right? And that, not everyone protects it. Sometimes those things are there by design, but that is a thing that stops you from connecting to anything on the other side of the between us. So if you, don't have, if you have a boss that doesn't want you to talk to people in other apartments, doesn't want you to talk to their boss, doesn't want you to talk to other people, quit your job, get another job, just move on. Or kill your boss. <laughs> <laughs> if you could get away with that. All right. Uh, closeness. This is how easily a node can connect with other nodes. So some organizations will make it hard, right? Some will make it easy. A lot of organizations are instituting like a Facebook at work, social networks of one kind or another. Uh, at my own company explained we have something called Convo. Um, for some reason, I always get these messages saying, someone tried to log in from Poland to your email account. And it's for some reason, it's this app Convo doing that. I don't know why, They're, maybe they built it in Poland. Anyway, closeness is a really important piece of it because it tells you how far you have to go or how uh, hard it is or what the difficulty is of connecting with other nodes. And the reason I'm telling you all this is because I, I do think that the um, understanding, navigating social networks is critical to getting what you want out of life, to moving into your purpose and all that. Um, someone has said, a couple of people said today, this is not a new idea. Uh, it's from 1930. Actually, this is from before we even had money. This goes back to hunter-gatherer days. This, you can see this in a tribe of baboons. You can see all of this stuff. You can see this in a bird societies. This stuff is not, uh, this is stuff is not um, only humans. This is all over nature. With me? Okay. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> um, we had, what else did we have? Okay, Tracy, open versus closed systems. Any questions about open versus closed systems? Because I think that's also a really, really important concept. I don't think that we're moving from one to another, by the way. I think we have both. Uh, in some ways, a closed system, all the closed system is is a system that's isolated from its environment in some way. So scientists, to do experiments, they have to do closed system or else they can't com do comparisons or learn anything. So scientists are always trying to create closed systems. My brother's a biomedical engineer and a researcher, and uh, they actually sometimes, there's a, such a thing as a torus. Anyone know what a torus is? Oh, I get to draw something. <laughs> okay, this is a torus. Oh, I don't have to draw it. It's like a donut. Okay, imagine a donut, right? That's a torus, a, a torus shape. And scientists use toruses, a round one with a hole in the middle, just a regular old donut with a hole in the middle. And the reason that the torus is so interesting to scientists is because you can actually simulate an open system with a torus because it's infinite. You can, and you can mathematically, what you do is you take a sheet of paper and mathematically you put it into a cylinder and map one into another. And then you take your tube and you map the circles to each other and you get a donut, which allows you to simulate an infinite, it's still a closed system but it's infinite in the sense that anything could go anywhere. So it gives you some interesting ways to simulate. And there's the Mobius strip. Anyone know about a Mobius strip? It's a one dimensional strip that you can also do, uh, have a, simulate an infinite environment there. So there's some kind of cool stuff that happens there. But a closed system simply, a factory is a closed system, right? Because you don't want customers messing things up, walking around the factory. A watch, it needs to be isolated from its environment in order to work. So that's good. So some things have to be isolated to work. If this watch was an open system, it would be a really shitty watch, right? <laughs> I mean, really. And so it's true with people too. Factories, you don't want customers walking around in a factory. You can create interesting things though. For example, uh, Starbucks. When you go into Starbucks, you're kind of a factory worker. You're a production line, right? You're going McDonald's drive through right? They've trained you. Number one. <laughs> Number two, family meal. Okay, move to the next window. It's just like, you're just like a car going through an assembly line. It's a factory. And they've created a closed system to do that because that's what they want. They want a system that has inputs and outputs and they make money, right? That's, a, that's still kind of, it's an open system because customers can do whatever they want. 
But once you're in the drive-thru, what happens if you change your mind? You're halfway through the drive-thru. What, you, what are you gonna do, right? Or you also have these weird things like, I did this at Starbucks drive-thru, I drove through, I was preoccupied and angry about something, and uh, I just handed her the money and I drove off. <laughs> like, hey, where's my coffee? I got to work, and I was like, whoa, what's, I gotta go back. <laughs> I went back, I wouldn't lie again. No, actually, I, I walked in, and they're like, oh yeah, that happens all the time, here you go. Um, Mark, so any questions about open versus closed systems? So closed is you want to protect it from the environment, so it's a factory. Open is you want, customers can walk in like a Walmart, right? The, you, the, the factory part of Walmart, it's all behind the scenes. It's distribution centers, logistics, backstage stuff, um, but really the store itself is an open system because that's why you walk in and there's two people at the checkout line and you have 30 people lined up because they just weren't prepared for that. You don't make an appointment to go to Walmart, do you? Dave, we have a question. Oh. I didn't even throw yeah. the arm. Hi. Okay, well, I'm gonna start with the question that I have now to challenge what you're saying. Great. I'm not sure I completely agree, um, but it, I, at the end of my question, I'd actually like to share some of my thoughts on what I've been hearing and what, what it means to me over this period of time. So the first one is, your, your, the way you're talking about a closed system, uh, your employees are also customers, so whether it's a factory or whether it's Starbucks or whether it's McDonald's, those employees that are inside your so-called closed system are actually also customers, which puts them both inside and outside, which means that it's not a closed system, it's actually, in my mind, an open system. But Yeah, well, I mean, I guess even a factory, even my watch is an open system to some degree, Correct. right? So, yeah. so what I'm, what the point that I kind of want to go with that is it's largely to do with your perception and your, your orientation of where you're looking at the problem. Or how do you know my, how problem. do you know what that is though? No, I, I don't. I'm okay. Just, I'm just saying. So, <laughs> so then to kind of close that off and pick up on the, the bigger picture here for me is um, what I was hearing earlier about the silence was more around like a pregnant pause of there's something that needs to be created and it's a, it's a pattern that I've seen in, in a lot of the talks that there's a future state of how organizations can work more either effectively or whatever effective is for that organization or whatever, whatever success looks like, they can be better at whatever it is they do. Um, but it's not particularly realized right now. And one of the ways to get in touch with something that's unknown, so going from unknown to known or a change in state is letting the space be open and maybe bringing in more space for emotion and other qualities. Um, and then another theme that I keep hearing is that triggers for me is around unconscious bias. So our unconscious bias that we're not addressing. So whether it's I'm a woman or whether it's, you know, I'm an artist or whether it's I'm a certain color or whatever it is, it, it, the theme of diversity and being able to harness diversity in any setting to get to a better conclusion or a conclusion that we can't realize right now because we're all stuck in this homogenous group and we all think the same. So if we can open the system to be getting ideas from diverse areas and finding the patterns and the harmony in that, we might be able to realize a better future state. Yeah, I, don't, I, I don't hear anything that challenges anything I believe or that I don't agree no, with. I, I don't think it's challenging. <laughs> I think what, I, what I'm, the thing that I was challenging really was saying open and closed, you know, <coughs> two separate things. Like, I didn't quite agree with some of the things you were saying about a closed system. I'm just, well, I'm they're important I'm concepts to system. consider because um, and the, re the reason scientists like closed systems that, that is because that, like, I'll give you an example. Um, anyone heard the term neurogenesis in this room? All right, uh, thank you, of course you have. Of course she has, she studies the brain. Of course she has. Neurogenesis is the idea that whether, the question of whether brain cells regenerate or not. Now, when I was in school, the answer was no. Don't, don't do drugs, don't kill your brain cells because they'll never grow back. I, I didn't listen, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty stubborn that way, but here's, here, I'll connect this back to open and closed systems, okay? So um, they, all the research had backed up this idea that brain cells don't regenerate, but all the research had been done within a closed system called a laboratory. So it's kind of like as if you had done all your research on human beings, but only in prison. Because these are animals that are kept in cages, they're not stimulated by their environment at all, they're sitting there in cages in a lab. And so the scientist goes to the cage and pulls out the cage prison rat and does their experiments. And then they put the rat back in the cage and they say, see, brain cells don't regenerate. And there's a woman and uh, 
Her name is Gould. I can't remember her first name. Elizabeth Gould, I think, at Princeton, who did this research with rats in very stimulating environments and cages and more natural uh, stuff with animals. And she determined, oh, look at this. Brain cells actually regenerate. And no one believed her for years and years because she was a woman, because she was an out, even though she was a Princeton researcher, there was a very well established guy whose name I totally forget, I think at Harvard or MIT, who had his whole career on the line if she was right, <laughs> right? All his research would have to be thrown away. Well, it turns out she was right. Um, the guy was able to, and his team of, you know, science is peer review too, right? And who's the peer review? White men usually, probably, right? <laughs> Not that anyone's in science is really tackling this problem, but peer review is as good as the peers are, right? And so the peers were probably all buddy, I'm assuming, I'm making extrapolations, but I think the peers were probably mostly but a lot of buddies of this guy, and so they kind of kept her research under, they kind of suppressed it in the same way that the taxi commission in St. Louis has been trying to suppress Uber, unsuccessfully, successful in the short term, unsuccessful in the long term. But that is uh, what happens when you, uh, so there are errors that come up with closed systems. Uh, no, no system, I agree with you, is completely closed. Um, even a vacuum jar probably has some leakage. Right, so no matter what you do, even scientists, you're, gonna, you, you're trying to create a frame or a box that allows you to compare what happens in box A and box B and see if there's a difference. But you're always, I mean, science has some real challenges with trying, to, you know, when you're a naturalist, you're studying animals, you've got to go where they are to, I mean, like Jane Goodall did a lot of great work with chimpanzees by studying them in the natural environment, but even then, the observer affects the equation, right? So even then, we should always think about um, any scientific result, we should always understand the box. That's called initial conditions. The box is some, a really important piece to understand because if someone says, well, chocolate's good for you now, you wanna ask, within what conditions, within what parameters, what are the boundary conditions within which this experiment was conducted because you start understanding a lot more about what's real when you start looking at the box that the experiment was done in. Have I beaten this one to death yet? Okay. <laughs> um, Mark, practical know-how, great tips. I don't have much more to say than that other than are there any questions for Mark? <laughs> Jamie. <laughs> yeah, yarn. So, this is, oh yeah, okay, so one of the things that Mark said that I really liked, and he had a slide for it, it was a little bit dark, but I could still figure out what it was. It was like a guy on the Grand Canyon sort of scenario, where it was like we don't really believe what we're saying. Um, hmm. This is sort of the thing you were saying, like, so the difficulty in change and transformation and behavior and everything is that <clears throat> we say one thing, but we don't actually believe what we say. And then tied with that, I believe it was Tabitha who said, all we have is our experience, right? And this is why I think that positive thinking is bullshit because we can keep telling ourselves, oh, I am going to do this and I'm going to be this amazing entrepreneur and I'm going to do this. And you wake up every day and you tell yourself this positive thought, but do you actually believe it? Maybe not because all you have is your experience which may include childhood trauma, may include your parents being really shitty, maybe include bullying in school and these types of things. So you don't actually believe what you're saying <clears throat> and this is why I have a problem with positive thinking. So I guess <clears throat> to turn into a question, because you want me to take the yarn and ask you a question. It's okay if you don't. We, we can <laughs> is, take. We can live is with the from comment. Your experience, like I didn't realize that you went from the artist situation uh, of you know, um, and now being called by your brother the lucky, lucky idiot. idiot. <laughs> I didn't realize that was part of your story, and that's super <laughs> interesting to me because. I rejected becoming an artist because I didn't want to be like my uncle who was only eating porridge and popcorn because he was so poor. Uh, and so I'm curious to know if you, because it seems like you don't believe in positive thinking either, or maybe you do, I'm not sure, I'm assuming. I, I have a kind of a hot qualified answer like the gentleman but, over here. But my question is, how did you get into what you're doing now? Because I love that you draw and all the things that you do. Um, so how did you get to the point where you were just like, I'm just going to do this anyway and fuck those people? Um, and I, uh, if you could explain this while drawing, I would be like a super fan. <laughs> I'm already a super fan, but... Explain how I got there with, with the drawing. Uh, I got to do some drawing, and I know we're running short of time. Um, the answer to your question, uh, I, uh, 
I literally, I brought up Star Wars earlier, but I was 14 years old when I saw Star Wars in 1977, I think it was. Uh, is that right, 77? I, I saw it, um, I was on the way to the theater, I was like, this will never be as good as 2001. That's the best science fiction film ever created. This could not possibly touch it, okay? 14 year old, arrogance. <laughs> I go into the movie and from almost the first instant I was blown away, this universe full of life, I was like, I, was, I just realized how puny my imagination was in that moment because I was like, oh my God, I, even on the way here, I could not even have imagined. And suddenly there's this universe bursting with life. Even the robots are alive talking to you. Uh, this incredible universe. And I walked out of that film, so just transformed, actually. And then I, uh, around the same time on PBS, there was the Bill Moyers interviewing Joseph Campbell. Uh, Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey, who's kind of looked across comparative mythology across the world and found common themes. And uh, Bill Moyers, what a great interviewer, was interviewing this guy. And the big thing that Joseph Campbell kept repeating, well, what's the meaning of the hero's journey? What's the story? What is the, why do we have the hero's journey? Why is it such an important thing? And I mean hero in a non-gender specific way, okay? Let's just, let's just stop to putting et in, in on the end of words and just say a hero. You're still a hero. <laughs> You know, we don't, I don't say fisherman anymore, I say angler. <laughs> but I don't say fisher person, right? I don't know, anyway. Um, <laughs> it just feels silly. So hero, for me, is everybody who wants, anyone is the hero of your own life. You're the hero of your own life. And his big message was, follow your bliss. Which is in, in Mark, uh, in, sorry, in uh, Vicus's language, that's listen to the whisper of your heart, right? In, um, in uh, uh, everyone has a different word for it. I use the word purpose for it. Find your You have to actually pay attention to your own reaction to that information. Are you feeling fear, anger, stress when you're hearing that? Or are you feeling really curiosity and interest? I think in this room today, there's been a lot of curiosity and interest. But when you are hearing something that threatens you, like I had a little argument with an Apple fanboy this morning on Facebook about the Apple Watch. <laughs> he didn't like my opinions at all. <laughs> uh, you can tell when someone's coming from a place of combativeness, being defensive, or whether they're coming from a place of, wow, this is another opinion that's different than mine. I have something to learn from it, right? This is how we get Trump. It's fear electing him. It's fear. It's not curiosity. Well, I guess it's, for, for me, I'm very curious. I am for curious what happens there. So those are the two, that's what keeps you, that's forward motion. So fear, cautiousness is like your break. You can slow down. If you're feeling fear or cautiousness, you should slow down. This is what most organizations haven't figured out. They're ADD, as Mark said, they're running around busy like the chickens with their heads cut off. So they, and they know they, they think they need to go faster, so they're going the opposite direction because these organizations are filled with fear, anxiety, and stress. And the only way to reduce that is to slow down. Because it's an indicator you should slow down. Dave, we have a question. <laughs> I'm not done. Uh, keep going. We have, I have to keep going here. In, Curiosity will speed you up, right? Think about, if, it's just like you're driving yourself. Curiosity speeds you up, fear slows you down, that's good. If you're a rabbit and there's a wolf outside the rabbit hole, of course you'd be stupid to go out there. That's good fear, right? If there's just a cardboard cutout of a wolf, then it's bad fear. You have to be able to be curious enough to figure out the difference. And then there, there's an east and a west here too. And the east is good, and the West is evil. How do you know good or evil? Again, you listen to your heart. You know, you know. Usually you know. How many people work in an organization? Well, I can't ask you to show hands. Just think to yourself if you work in an organization whether it's good or evil. I'll tell you right now, if it's chasing money, if money's the goal, it's evil. I'm gonna put a stake in the ground. If money's the goal, it's an evil organization. I will take the question, what does someone say? Someone say amen, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I had a question. Yeah, so I'm curious, when you're talking about curiosity and fear, yeah. uh, if you talk to a biologist about the, the core of, of, of human or animal behavior, you might hear that it's fight or flight. Or freeze, there's another one. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just wondering, how would you... Those are all fear. Those are all fear. Those are all going to the category. That's the amygdalic response. Um, I'm sure the learning pirate would be able to tell us all about that. But basically what happens is 
you have uh, three, different people divide it differently, but there's a part of our brain that we have in common with reptiles, which some people call the limbic system, the, um, the primitive brain, or different, a dinosaur brain, there are different words for it. Its only job is to keep us safe. So it prioritizes fear, actually. It's once, it keeps us cautious. So what happens is, um, anyone know the feeling of being triggered, like somebody says something, you're just pissed off, and, and you're, it shuts down your frontal cortex, literally, shuts down your, as long as you have that uh, magdalic response, thinking is a waste of en body's energy. You should either, if you're really threatened with a, a wolf, or a big grizzly bear in the room, thinking is not what you need to do, you need to get out, out of there. So the, the amygdala and the limbic system have a way of shutting down the brain, uh, higher functions to get you out of the problem. But the problem is this, is, this is a very old system. So if your boss walks in and you have that grizzly bear response, <laughs> it's not helpful to what you're trying to accomplish, right? Because your boss is not going to probably sh shred you with his fangs or her fangs. The boss is probably not going to is probably just maybe a person with kids and a family, uh, probably not trying to kill you, right? So, but nevertheless, our job security, our fear of losing money, our, all those fears, and that's the thing. Uh, I'm gonna draw one diagram here. I know we're really short on time. I do wanna tell you that I have about 20, so, 20 or so slots. I'm going in a deep dive on this on Saturday. I've got a little sign up thing that I'll share with everybody, but it's gonna, there's only room for 25 because I had to borrow, beg, borrow and steal a, a room for it. So if you're around Toronto on Saturday, 20 or so of you can come. <laughs> this is awful, isn't it? I'm so sorry that it's not more. Uh, but I'll also offer to, to Skype with anyone who wants to go deeper on any of this. Um, but the, what was the drawing I was gonna make? Shoot. Uh, oh, it's about, this is about the last 200 years, 300 years, okay? Someone said, uh, was, it, was it the learning, was it you, learning pirate, who said you like really appreciate the time, the seeing things in time? Anyway, someone said, yeah, you were talking about treasure maps, remember? And you like that people share the time. So think about this as a, uh, 200 years, 1800 to uh, 2000, right? Here's the thing. In 1800, 90% of the population of North America were farming. Okay? Anyone want to guess what it is today? It's about two. All right, so here's what happened over the last 200 years. Every single farmer knows that you don't need money to start a farm. You just need some land and some seeds, right? And you know if you're a farmer, you know you're not going to make money for about a year, right? Because you have to grow the seeds and you have to have a harvest and you have to bring them in. This has been life all the way up until the Industrial Revolution. This has been natural human life. This is the way it works. You gotta earn it. You gotta work. You, and you, work, you might have to work for a year or two or three before you've got a skill and a trade and we've sort of substituted college for this apprenticeship, which is what it used to be. Like you'd learn the farm with your family or you'd learn how to be a blacksmith by studying under the blacksmith, or how to be an artist like me by studying under uh, Rembrandt, Studio Rembrandt, whatever. So what happened? The um, Industrial Revolution happened, and it looks something like this. That's World War I and World War II, by the way. And it ends up about 20, it's roughly around 20% right now. That's probably not, it should be a little higher. Let's make this a little, anyway. Uh, manufacturing. So people who work on a farm, we have about two out of 100 work on a farm. But we, but we actually have more food than we had in 1800, right? I mean, we, we have actually figured out how to make a lot of food with 2% of the population. 20%, of, another 20% is factory workers, right? What's the rest of everyone doing? Probably everyone in here. Anyone here work in a factory or a farm? All right, so what do we all do? Huh? What do we all do, all of us? What? Yeah, okay. I'm going to say services. Send email. Services, right? So we're, we're in these factories that are trying to provide services. And what happens when a factory tries to provide a service? It sucks. This is why you hate your bank. This is why you hate your phone company. This is why you hate your government. 
They say they're providing services, but they are not. They're providing these factory things. When you go to your, I can't even, I don't even want to talk to my bank because I know I'm going to have 30 minutes just waiting and navigating their phone system. And then I'm going to get to someone and then they're going to let me go and push me off onto somebody else. And then I have to tell my whole story. I'm going to have to tell my whole story to the voicemail system by typing it in. Then I'm going to have to tell it to the first person. Then I'm going to bounce to the next person. So what do I do? I go to Google and I just sit there and fume. <laughs> I'm fuming at my bank right now. I'm fuming at my cable company and my power company. I'm angry, so angry at all of them. Services have to operate differently. So what can we do? What can you do now? What can we do today? Uh, and then we can go deeper. As we can go very far down this rabbit hole as far as you want to go. But here's the number one thing. Um, listen to your heart. Think about what Vika said. Find your purpose. Because nothing else, even if it's going to be provisional, your purpose is going to change as you figure things out, because you don't know what you don't know. You, you, I want to apprentice to a fireman. Okay, firefighter. I apprentice to the firefighter. Eh, I don't like fires, actually. I mean, maybe I'll do something else. So you, you find out as you, you just learn and you figure it out. And you want to find your Obi-Wan, right? Find your Obi-Wan. Because that will be the person, or your Yoda, or your yoga, because that will be the thing that helps you find your purpose. That'll be the person or the thing that helps you find it. Notice your inner states. Pay attention to your feelings. If you're feeling stressed, if you have negative emotions, recognize them and look around and figure out what's causing them and whether they're actually real and start actually testing whether they might be not true. Because uh, most of what I've accomplished in life, I've, got, I've accomplished by just trying things that people told me were impossible. So let's even say, put a zero here. Um, this is a thing that will help you. If you can become a possibilitarian, this is my religion. A possibilitarian is someone who will, believes that anything is possible, and if they think it's impossible, they'll test it, they'll design an experiment to test it. Okay? This is what's holding even science back right now. Science has not yet imagined the idea that consciousness is something that's not contained in our heads. No one in science that I'm hearing is talking about, well, maybe a few Buddhists are, talking about the idea that consciousness could be a field or a wave like gravity or light that we're all tapping into, which is what I believe. Um, I think it's possible. I've actually looked, you know, how do I test whether it's possible? I go and see if there's any evidence to the contrary. Um, there's none, zero. There's no evidence. In fact, science has no evidence that consciousness even exists. The only evidence that any of us have for consciousness is our own inner state. So no scientist has figured out how to put that in a laboratory in a closed system yet. No scientist has figured out how to figure out how to do anything with consciousness. Because no scientist, it's actually outside the boundaries of what science is capable of investigating right now. I think, I consider Buddhism a type of science, a uh, science of the inner state. And uh, it's, it's, it's a thousands of years, it's older than the empirical method, and it's an incredibly powerful tool for you know, what we really need to navigate the world is this compass thing that I drew, but also this idea that there's an outer world that is objective, there's an inner world that is subjective, and there are feedback loops that connect the two, and if you keep cycling through those feedback loops, you will find that there are connections, and you will find yourself getting a better grasp of reality, because words, in a way, create a prison for us. And this is the visual spatial thinker in me. I've learned almost everything I've learned by watching what people and animals do and kind of ignoring for the most part what they say. And you'd be amazed what you can discover if you just really learn to notice things. There's a lot to notice. So the first step, listen. Find your purpose. Find it in your heart. The, and make it explicit. The School of the Possible is designed, by the way, to facilitate all this stuff. It's totally free. You can be a teacher for free, you can be a student for free, you can be both for free. Um, it's just basically not about money, it's just a network. So anyone here is welcome to join, as long as you're ready to be a possibilitarian. <laughs> we can't have any toxicity, we can't have anybody saying things are impossible. Ideas are seeds, right? You can't look at a table with a bunch of seeds on it and evaluate the seeds. It's stupid, it's a stupid thing to do. You have to plant them in the ground and water them and see what grows up. <laughs> and you know, so 
we have this, someone said, we have all the solutions in our company. The fact is, we all have all the solutions. We just kill them. We're just busy, too busy stomping on seeds and t saying they're no good. Then we're not testing, we don't test a, a tenth of a tenth of them. We have to test them. In fact, if you don't test, you have to test the ideas that are most absurd. Because if you're only testing stuff that you think is going to work, then you're not going to ever learn anything. You just won't learn unless you test stuff that you think is ridiculous. That's when you learn. That's how Tesla learned, uh, right? That's how Apple learned. That's how people learn. They test things that they think, you have. what did Steve Jobs say? You have to be crazy. You have to be insane enough to test these crazy things. So make it explicit. And we have a thing at the School of the Possible, which is a really simple, like a lab, we call it a lab page, but it's a very simple set of questions that you answer and articulate your purpose and make it explicit and put it on the internet, which is actually a very scary thing. I had a mentor of mine say to me, um, I'm like, he's a branding guy. He did branding for WebMD. He's like deep insider in Silicon Valley. I said, have you ever actually sat down to write and articulate your purpose? And he said, no. I'm like, why not? You're a branding guy. You did this for every single customer that you ever worked for. And you won't do it for yourself. You haven't done it for yourself. You know what he said to me? Have anyone have a, anyone have a guess? Yeah. Well, I'm scared of what I might have to do. If I actually wrote it down, I might have to do it. Okay, well, that is pretty fucking scary. It is to write it down, just to write it down. And I think someone said that's the first step and the most important step. It's halfway there. Vika said it. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't get to everyone. Did I? These are all so great. Everything that everyone said. Uh, share your treasure. Make a map. Create your legacy. That's what I'm doing with the school, the possible. Um, get on, just join up and make a, a, a lab page for yourself on Medium and we'll invite you in. That's the beginning of the network. That's the first step in the journey. Here's your call to adventure. Okay? I'm the, uh, I'm the stormtrooper who burned down your, your family and they're all gone. And here you are, Luke, with your two robots and your mad, crazy madman. What are we going to do? Write down your purpose. <laughs> that's my answer. Write it down. Put it on the internet. Start connecting. Because that's the first step to connecting with other people who have that purpose. And then there are lots of things we can do uh, from there. But uh, I think I'm going to st probably stop because we're running over this. We're 15 minutes over the end of the event, right? I think, as far as I remember. Should I stop? Should I keep going? <laughs> Jason, tell me what to do. <laughs> uh, listen, make it explicit. I got, I'll, I'll finish this list. Connect with others, right? That's obvious, so get it on the internet. Make it explicit, connect with others. Organize. Um, I'm gonna tell you one thing about organizing. Everyone's a been asking me, because I'm a visual guy, and here's, this is for you, uh, Jamie. Everyone's been asking me, what's the org chart of the future look like, right? Okay, it actually looks just like the or chart up today, but it operates in a completely different paradigm, all right? And this I am 100% confident in. And you can take that as a crazy man, or you can take it as maybe I'm, it might be worth testing for yourself, all right? So here's, a, here's an org chart, right? Familiar, right, pretty much? I mean, I know they should be squared off. Uh, people don't really report to intersections, though. They report to other people. So this is what it really looks like, right? So what's the problem with the org chart today? Uh, there's no feedback loops. There's just stuff that goes, it goes, there, well, there are feedback loops, excuse me, but it goes down, order, their goals up here, they go down to customers, uh, et cetera, then slowly the reports, the lies come up, right? Oh, everyone's gaming the system. Oh, complaints are down. How do you get the complaints to go down? We took the phone number off the website. <laughs> Well, okay, you met your goal, but you really aren't kind of connecting with the objective we had here, which is to become more customer-centric and, and reduce complaints. And we were just using that to measure it. We really didn't want you to just focus on the number just so you could get your bonus, but that's what people do, right? That's what they do. So what's the feedback loop in the org chart of the future? Well, first of all, it's not focused on goals per se. It's got a north star, true north which is this shared purpose of the organization, right? And then within that, um, this whole hierarchy, anyone who gets pissed off can just leave because nobody's getting paid. They're all making their own money. 
They're all working in a network, just like Jason, you have what, six people in your network that work together. You operate as a sort of a flock, like an organization, but you, everyone's autonomous. So they have agreed to operate as an organization. There's about six coaches. They figured out, oh, we can coach you on everything. If you connect all of us up, we can coach you on just about anything. So they figured it out. Um, I don't know if you have this rule, but it probably do, right? If you're pissed off, you take your team and you leave, right? Excuse me, I don't want basic shapes for 199. <laughs> How can I stop? How does it, it won't let me, all right. So that's, that's the feedback loop, right? That's the feedback loop. The feedback loop is if you're a bad leader, you don't get any followers. That's the feedback loop in the org chart of the future, right? You only have followers to the degree that people share your purpose and your mission. Who, who did this? How is it done? How about a guy named uh, Mao Zedong, right? How about a guy named George Washington? Uh, how about a, um, you know, basically any revolutionary has to work with an all-volunteer force, right? Any, any revolutionary has to work with an all-volunteer force. And in fact, it's actually better. It works better. When everyone, and you know, we all talk about it, nobody has accountability around here, right? This is how you give them accountability. You're accountable for your life. You're accountable for what work you do. You're accountable to figure it fucking out. <laughs> You're accountable to learn a trade, you know? You're accountable to, you know, it's your life. There's a million organizations, and the thing that needs to change is we need to move from uh, find a job to create a customer, and that's the difference. If you create a customer, you have a lot more options. If you find a job, you're forcing yourself into a factory uh, cog. I think we should wrap it up. People are getting restless. Thanks, everybody. Oh, the, uh, the place to go. If you want to join me on Saturday, the place to go is an Eventbrite. I think it's just school. The, Jamie, was it just school? Eventbrite slash school of the possible? Is that right? I think. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm just going to look it up. If you do want to join me on Saturday, um, you can join me at. Um, Eventbrite. It's Eventbrite forward slash E. Oh, that doesn't sound right. I'll send it to Jason and, and we'll get it out to you. Okay? All right, let's get another round of applause Thanks. for Dave. All right, and that uh, closes our first day. So uh, before we go, just give yourselves a round of applause for uh, all your attention today. And we will see you all bright and early tomorrow morning.